Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today we're going to talk about crisis leadership. Now, that seems rather appropriate as we approach the 20th anniversary of September 11, and I'm actually doing this episode from New York City. I'm about two blocks from the World Trade Center. I'm up here with a reunion of first responders because, uh, well, this episode is going to be a little bit different because my guest today is Captain G. Mark Hardy talking about his experience on that date in a recording made nearly 20 years ago for the Navy Leadership School. So let's take a listen. From G. Mark Hardy, sent Tuesday, September 11, 2001, 11 p.m. Subject, sit rep from ground zero. It's been about 14 hours since the attack and New York is settling in for an uneasy night's sleep. There's still a sense of unreality as to what happened as if somehow we'll wake up tomorrow and find out it was only a bad dream. I was in Midtown at the time. Our meeting was interrupted by a knock at the door. Our meeting leader ducked out for a minute and staggered back in, face ashen. This can't be real. The World Trade Center, it's been destroyed. Uh, the Pentagon's been attacked. The World Trade Center, the perennial punctuation at the end of the New York skyline, was gone. In its place was what firefighters described to me as a moonscape. Walking south through the 40s and the 30s and the 20s, the city changed as well. Midtown was business as usual, but that changed around 35th Street. More and more shops were closed, doors were gated, lights were out, and hastily drawn closed signs peered from the windows. The life of the city seemed to draw down the closer one got to the hole. And fast forward a few hours. I've taken charge of the Military Command Center at 340 West Street. Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, I showed up for work at 0800 up in Manhattan. And about 46 minutes later, the first plane hit uh, the first World Trade Center, and then everything changed from then. I was up in 51st, so I was up in Midtown. And initially, we had no idea what had happened. The building I was in was, of course, a large skyscraper. There were no windows in the room I was in. And it probably it was uh, probably close to an hour later or so before somebody knocked on the door. And they stopped the class, and the instructor went out, like, well, what is it? And he disappeared for a moment. And he came back with this look on his face, and he just kind of staggered and kind of collapsed in his seat. I was like, what happened? It's like, did your mom die or something? He said, no, the, uh, the World Trade Center has been destroyed. The Pentagon's been attacked. Uh, and it just was surreal. And of course, we ran out to look out the window, and the building only faced north. So we saw blue skies, and we saw cars and people down below, and it looked completely normal. But yeah, we turned on the radio, and it was like War of the Worlds, where there's a war going on there, and all these reports coming from from down there, and yet uh, outside it looked uh, perfectly fine. There was a lot of panic. People didn't know what to do. The phones weren't working. You couldn't dial off the island. And uh, people were saying, well, maybe our building's next. Where do we hide? What do we do? And it was just kind of interesting watching the whole range of emotions. Uh, and so I went back into the room with the folks, and I said, well, you don't know who I am yet because I just met you an hour ago, uh, but I'm a, an officer in the United States Navy, and we're under attack, and it's my duty to go respond, so I'm going down there. And they kind of looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, but I had already decided what, I, what the right thing to do was. Walked out and headed south. And as I headed over west to get over down to 6th Avenue, you turn the corner. And if you've ever been in New York and you're familiar with it, you look down and all the way at the end is the World Trade Center. And it was gone. It was just missing. There was nothing there but a huge column of smoke. It, it looked like something out of a Steven Spielberg movie. You figured just it's not real. And as I'm walking south, I'm like the goldfish going the wrong way. There's 10,000 people going this way, literally. One guy going the wrong way. And the farther downtown I went, the more the scenery changed. First of all, there were fewer people, and then a couple stores were closed. Then all the shops were closed. Little hastily scrawn, handwritten notes on the windows. And by the time I get from the 30s to the 20s, it was like going to a ghost town. When I get down there in town toward uh, Greenwich Village. People were running around, and some of them were just sort of, uh, I don't think they got it. They were looking at it, you know, posing for their photographs in front of it. Uh, somebody going by saying, uh, you know, I wonder who they're going to get next, with no concept of who they were, or maybe even caring who that was. And uh, as they got down there to the perimeter where the police had set up, 
there were a number of military people walking around, and uh, and I of course was in civilian clothes because I was there on my first day on the job for a for a you know, big five uh, accounting firm. So I uh, asked the police officer, "Well, where's the military assembly?" He said, "Over there at 340 West Street." I went in the building, and there's a number of sergeants and, and other folks there. And I said, well, "Who's in charge?" And I said, "Well, we don't have any officers." I said, "All right, I'm an officer. I'll take command. What do we got?" So what we're able to do is identify people's skills and capabilities. We went down there and at first we thought our mission would be search and, and rescue. Hey, that's what you train for. And we got down there with some of the initial teams and they were doing the search, but it turned out there's no rescue. You either lived or you didn't. You survived or you died. And we found out pretty quickly that um, there just wasn't going to be any real heroics there. So over time, that evening, as the evening wore on, my role, I saw, was mostly in trying to keep the military volunteers who kept pouring in, and they signed in and we register and to keep track of them. But they understood a military chain of command. And when I got a call from somebody down there saying, they won't let us in the site, they won't let us go ahead and go digging for survivors, my response to them was, don't go, stop, or come back. As much as they wanted to go, they'd follow the orders and they came back. And probably the most valuable thing we had there is for the people who volunteered, is to give them a safety structure so they didn't go ahead and do dangerous things themselves. I was up for the first 40 hours. And you get to the point where you're sort of standing there, you're leaning on something so you don't have to stay erect. You keep your eyes closed because you're trying to conserve a little bit of energy to keep your brain working at full speed. I remember one of the young soldiers coming up saying, thank you, sir. He's like, for what? He says, for being here. Every time we come back here, you're a reference point. You always seem to know what's going on. You're always here. You've been calm through this whole thing. Uh, you let us keep going. I didn't realize at the time until he had said that just how important it is, particularly in a crisis situation, for somebody to be in a position that looks like they know what they're doing who's in control, who's calm, and is not afraid to make decisions. And that meant a lot to these people. And at the time I was doing it because that was my response. That's the way I've been trained to do things. None of us had faced this before. This was a unique situation. It had never happened in the United States. You know, last time we'd been attacked on U.S. soil by a foreign power on the continental United States was, what, 1814, 1850? It'd been a little while. Kind of lost corporate memory. Didn't quite have any reference manuals to go back to. And that was sort of the point. You couldn't do this one by the book because there was no book on it. And any book that might have been written was written by somebody sitting in an office under electric light, probably on a keyboard, and they had no concept of what it was like. This was pretty close to battle conditions. You had a lot of dead people, a lot of destruction around you, no communications, no way to get in contact with folks. You had to improvise, you had to establish your own chain of command, and you had to make the call. And the hard part was is that I had not been given at that point any formal authority to go ahead and take these actions. It wasn't until later that I went up and I looked through Navy regulations very carefully and finally found there in Article 10 something, I think of 1005 or whatever, that gave me authority in a situation like that to actually take command. But I didn't know that in advance. I was just doing it because it was the right thing to do. And there's some that would suggest that uh, you place yourself in a significant personal liability. What happens if your people got killed? Who are they going to go look for and who are they going to go hang because looking for somebody who's accountable. And that's a two-edged sword, I think, of taking charge and leadership is that with leadership comes accountability. You have to accept the consequences for accomplishing the mission, but you also have to accept the consequences of what happens if you fail to accomplish the mission or if your people get injured or killed in the process. Um, if that scares you, don't lead. But if you're willing to take that personal risk, and it may not necessarily have to be a personal physical risk. You're not exposed to the line of fire from a sniper, but you may be exposed to the line of fire from some other concerns. Go ahead and do the right thing, and you'll find out that uh, fear will go away. When you focus on a task, when you focus on a mission, yeah, we're all scared. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know the next attack, whether it was coming. We didn't know whether there were poison gases in there or... PCBs or any type of um, asbestos or whether the air was hazardous. Uh, time will tell. I'm part of a World Trade Center health registry. They're going to track us for the next 40 years and see how well we do. Initially, the first thing we tried to do was just account for people. Uh, once we were there, we went ahead and we got in touch with the fire department. Uh, and 
working with the emergency rescue. Initially, the concern was, are there people in there? Are they trapped? Can we get them out of there? Uh, we also worked with the police department as well. We had, uh, we had three junior ROTC kids drive down from Connecticut. Couldn't have been 16 years old. What can we do to help? Well, you can't put them in harm's way, but we go ahead and hooked them up with the police department. They went and they directed traffic. So the police department then freed up these people. So what we basically did is we backfilled. We took over non-critical positions that were being done by law enforcement and by fire department and some of the rescue teams so that those trained professionals could concentrate on doing the most under the circumstances. So, you know, that was probably the biggest activity. The second one was then beginning on the 12th and then on the 13th was doing the, uh, the body part pickup. There was a lot of you know, pieces of you know, human remains that were out there that just couldn't be left out. And, Again, these folks, because they're in uniform, were accepted as part of the team. Nobody was saying, why were you here? Why are you doing this? Uh, it was considered that, hey, we're all part of this on the, on the same end. Again, when it was formally established, we eventually got the, the chain of command in place. They did the right thing, which is to go ahead and say, okay, all the volunteers, time to leave. We have the paid professionals to come in here. So it was important for people to know when to back out and, and when to go home. And, and what I tried to do is summarize uh, a series of eight lessons that I think were applied to anybody who finds themselves in a crisis situation. The first one was to assess the situation. Figure out what's going on, know what's happening. Uh, you know, the first report is almost always wrong. We thought we had heard that uh, there's an accident or there's a bomb had gone off in the tower. Uh, take the time to figure out exactly what's going on and know what it needs to do. You're never going to get 100% of the facts, but a good leader knows how to go ahead and make a good decision with most of the facts and, and then do the right thing. Um, the second one is control your fear. Uh, you're going to be afraid. It's going to scare the daylights out of you. And people around you are going to be scared as well. But if you focus on the mission, if you determine what it is that you need to get done, that gives you the courage to overcome your fear. And that focus all of a sudden takes your attention away from what's distracting you and lets you focus on what you need to do. The third one is just take charge. You know, Norm Schwarzkopf had said, when placed in command, take charge. And that's really what it comes down to because you'll find yourself in a crisis situation where nobody will be in command. It's a crisis. There wasn't supposed to be a command structure. And so people are looking for direction. And whether it's a medical emergency and it's just saying, you, go to the phone, dial 911, call for emergency to come back and tell me you did it. People will do that. But if you just yell help, People stand around. They want to watch. They want to see what's going on. So by taking charge, you put a control into the circumstances. And you got to know when it is time to step up to the plate. The other recommendation is do what's right, not just what's legal. If we'd gone ahead and tried to do everything by the book, we'd still be there trying to read the book or write the book. Sometimes it's a matter of just going ahead and taking action and doing the right thing. You find out that oftentimes what's legal was developed in a vacuum from what the circumstances that you're actually encountering. So. You're going to feel a little bit uneasy about things at times, but you recognize that if you're doing the right thing, that you're going to make the proper difference. Uh, know what your goal is. I mean, early on we set a goal to say, well, we can't go and lift the building, we can't do amazing things, but we can do support. And so my goal was to account for all of our people, to be able to get them to support the fire department, the police department, the FEMA folks, and doing whatever roles that they assign to them, again, usually backfill roles, and then be able to go ahead and have everybody be comfortable with that position. And um, it would have been wrong to go ahead and set a goal to say, okay, everybody go in there and start digging, or everybody go ahead and try to recover. So the goal has to be realistic, it has to be proper, it has to be within the bounds of the circumstances. So you want to be part of the solution, not the problem. Another piece of advice would be to delegate. You can't do it all. You can't make all the decisions, you can't take all the actions. So you need to build trust among your people. They will trust you if you make good decisions, if you treat them properly, and if you're, you're consistent and you're forthright in what you're doing. doesn't necessarily mean you say pretty please with everything. You can be very directive if you need to. But by delegating, by finding people, by finding what their skills were, I found people who, again, who were good at uh, search and recovery, they had had experience, they had training with that, they had uh, EMTs, medical folks, assign them in roles that made sense to it, and then put them in charge and then let them run with it. And you find out that in most circumstances, the right people, the right type of people, will try to do the right thing, and you get a lot more done. Be flexible. Situation is going to change. You're going to find out that what you thought was true is not, and you need to adapt. If you stay with the same game plan, you're going to continue to make 
decisions based upon outdated information. You could potentially put your people in jeopardy. Uh, you could put the mission in jeopardy. You might even get somebody hurt or killed. So you need to recognize that, that you have to evolve with the change. And the last part is to know when you're done. You gotta know when to disengage. Because at some point a crisis is going to end, an emergency is gonna be over, your role is gonna be finished. Our time to disengage was when the Army National Guard came in and said, we're in charge, we've got it, we're taking over. And at that point, I shifted my responsibilities from taking care of my people to checking them out, making sure they're all accounted for. And that's an emotional difficulty. It's tough to back out, but you have to do that. That's part of your responsibility. I didn't run into the building. I didn't rescue somebody. I, I didn't risk my life. I didn't die in it. Those are the heroes. The heroes are the people you'll never be able to, never be able to hear your applause because they never made it out of the building. And I remember when I finally got back to the parking lot over in New Jersey at the long-term lot, and uh, I got to my car and thought, which of these cars here are not going to have somebody come back to? Well, thank you for listening through that. And it's a different experience today, and I hope you never have to deal with something like that. But more to the point of what you might be facing with, you know, we've got to reflect on the idea that Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel, had said that bad companies are destroyed by crisis. And so what is a crisis? It comes from the Greek, crisis, uh, sift or to separate. It is going to differentiate those who are going to survive from those who will not, those who can lead and follow to those who are going to be ineffective and not be a participant. Inherent in the crisis is a high degree of instability. These don't happen in a nice, normal, unfolding manner. Expect some chaos. Expect a lot of it. Expect things to not go the way you want them to go simply because you would hope that things do a little bit better. There's also a potential for extremely negative results. It's not just a small problem where it could be an issue, but a crisis says you could lose the entire organization. You can lose your reputation. You can lose your life if it gets really bad. And so the idea that a crisis can endanger continuity for the organization suggests that we really, really need to make sure that we're prepared for this. A crisis contains a surprise and the potential for dramatic change. Probably maybe a way to define that. Surprise with the potential for dramatic change. And if the crisis is big enough, it creates both a past and a future. Think about 9-11. We talk about before that date and after that date. A crisis can replace security with insecurity. And it's going to separate effective leaders from ineffective ones. Therefore, as we as cybersecurity leaders and professionals think about how does this apply to us, I wanted to get you to start thinking about the types of crises that might occur in our line of work. Ransomware. All of a sudden, you find out that uh, you're having to go ahead and deal with the issue of critical systems maybe locked up. You've got an attack on your availability but there's also maybe a confidentiality attack going on if somebody has said, hey, you're going to have to pay to get your files back. And, oh, by the way, we're going to release them. And you don't even know. I mean, do you have a plan for that? How about DDoS? We see these attacks take place from time to time where there's a major outage. Do you have a plan for that? A power or a system or a network outage. If you're in the cloud and your cloud provider goes down, well, usually the best they offer says, yeah, we'll refund your fees for the day that we were not running. That doesn't replace the millions that you probably lost by not being able to do business. How about the shortage of computer chips we have going on right now? I would call that a crisis. There's automobile manufacturers having to lay off people, having to idle plants, having 
a field full of vehicles assembled with everything but the $1 part that's absolutely essential to make it work. That's a crisis. Discovering a significant bug or a zero day in your own product, or somebody else usually discovers it in your own product, that represents a crisis type of thing. You get a call from law enforcement. Something has gone sideways, has gone rather poorly. Have you figured out how to deal with that? There's a compromise of sensitive information and therefore a big loss and then the potential lawsuits that might come sabotage. Somebody damages or destroys something, either a disgruntled employee or somebody else ruins some of your equipment. And then even executive scandals, things that create some great embarrassment for the organization, but could also fall down on us in terms of IT security and protecting our resources. And in cases, in some cases, where you have to go ahead and ensure that you're preserving evidence uh, even though you are kind of concerned a little bit about, you know, where's this going? Uh, it might be part of our job. So all these things are potential crises. And a crisis just doesn't arrive on schedule. It's come as you are. When it happens, you have to respond without having to have any advanced preparation to say, hey, um, I'm, I'm a little bit better. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. You can ignore it. You can hope it fixes itself. I remember years ago in Microsoft Excel, back in the 90s, I don't know what version it was, 95, 97, something like that, they had these little tip of the day. And they're usually technical tips. But the last tip, I remember dumping the database of tips just, just to find it. The last one was this. Things that go away by themselves can come back by themselves. A little bit of interesting wisdom there to find out in a, in a uh, Excel tip of the day. But nonetheless, things that... Uh, show up don't always go away by themselves either so it's not going to necessarily work hope is not a good strategy when it comes to dealing with a crisis you can wait for someone else to take action and again i consider this to be an ineffective strategy you could blame others claim to be a victim well again we see this happening don't we you could freeze or panic or you could take it head on and my goal here is to try to get you to start thinking about some of the things you should be doing and preparing yourself so that you can start to go through and rehearse some of these things. Now, crisis, a crisis will always generate confusion, something to keep in mind. There's a statement that's attributed to General George Patton. The first report is always wrong. And if you think about it, we see that in the media all the time. It's not to say don't trust the media. That's not my point. The point is, though, we've gone to the real world. Hey, we're live. We've got a reporter in front of this thing. There's smoke coming out of the building. Uh, what do you got, John? Well, you're not going to have the reporter saying, well, technically, we really have no information other than the fact we see smoke coming out of the building. So let's come back in a couple hours when we've talked to the police and the fire investigators, and we'll have more information. And like, John, you're still live, and you have another minute and 50 seconds to go. Oh, um, well, uh, yeah, I think it was a zombie apocalypse that had just happened, and we went ahead and had space invaders come through there, and, you know, and all of a sudden it just goes sideways. Plus, there's also a desire to provide a report. When somebody wants to tell you something is going on, you usually almost always in your first report have sketchy information. Think about it. Even like the OPM breach, 21.6 million records initially announced it. 250,000. And you can go through just about every major breach that you look out there, and you'll see the initial estimate is way, way low. The first estimate is always wrong. Assume that. Number two, think about Clausewitz's fog of war. Uh, now, Karl von Clausewitz was a, a Prussian um, military officer who wrote about military strategy. Unfortunately, he died before he had a chance to publish his book, and his widow published it. Uh, von Kriege on war. And in there is a treatise of mostly the Western way of thinking, kind of the counterpart to Sun Tzu Eastern way of thinking. And in Clausewitz, among some of the things he talks about is the fog of war, which is the uncertainty and situational awareness that you'll experience in military operations. Well, I'm going to extend that to a crisis because your situational awareness is going to involve a lot of uncertainty. You're not going to have the data. It's not going to be coming in correctly. And you're going to be confused. And expect that. Another warning, and this is more of a psychological thing. Beware of seeing what you want to believe. There's a lot of wishful thinking out there. Oh, this can't be that bad. Or this is the way it's going to go. We kind of know in our gut sometimes that something just isn't working out just right. So be careful. And not to try to go ahead and put wishful thinking ahead of careful analysis. What you want to be able to do is strive to make the right call. 
and you're not going to be able to get all the information. If you got 50% of it, you can be replaced with a coin toss. If you wait till you get 100% of the information before making a decision, you can be replaced with an algorithm. The real art comes with being able to go ahead and make the right call with about 65 or 70% of the information. And that takes experience. That takes judgment and something that you want to go ahead and practice. Your biggest obstacle in a crisis may be your own emotions. Depending upon what's happened or how bad it is, it could be the apprehension or grief or horror or rage, uh, guilt, anguish, uh, sadness. I mean, a lot of things, extra vigilance. Any of us who've been through a crisis, we kind of experience some of these things. And if you haven't practiced decision-making under stress, you may be unprepared for a crisis. Why? Because you can lose your rational decision-making capabilities. You become illogical. Kind of like the squirrel in the middle of the road. Go left, right, 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 left, left. <laughs> Splat, gone, no squirrel. You don't always know what you're going to do. In the military, you would have people that would be spectacular on paper. They're, everything is wonderful. They look like a great record. They put them in a combat and they wither. And other people who look like they're going to be behavioral problems. These are the, the bad boys, if you will. Uh, people graduating at or near the bottom of their class. Uh, and they figure like, yeah, no potential here. End up absolutely distinguishing themselves in crisis and difficult situations. I'm thinking of the late Senator John McCain as an example. Graduated at the bottom one to two percent of his Naval Academy class and yet went on to become not only an American hero, but a long time serving senator and American presidential candidate. Wow. And so you don't always know. And if you have not been tested by fire, you really have no way of knowing. So what do we do? How do we go ahead and, if you will, prepare for the unpreparable, so to speak? Well, there's a lot of references out there. Uh, John McHale of the Forbes Council offers four guidelines. Number one, determine the root of the problem. You want to ensure that you understand the situation. That's one of the first things you can do. Well, there's a saying that says, if you can keep your head when all about you, others are losing theirs, then you clearly don't understand the situation. Now, that first half actually was a Rudyard Kipling poem, and it's been adapted to that by what's sometimes called the Navy rule. Like if you keep your head when everybody else is losing theirs around you, you just don't understand what's going on. Or another fun quote is that confidence is the feeling you have before you understand the situation. But make sure you determine the root cause and understand what's going on. Number two, demonstrate control and communicate. It's important for someone to be in charge. Number three, be decisive and bold. It's not a good time for, should we go left? Should we go to right? I don't know. Let's take a break. Let's hold a conference. In a crisis, time is not your friend. And as a result, decisiveness becomes important. And boldness means sometimes acting promptly to take an action before you head off something that could be a whole lot worse. And then this fourth one is remember it's okay to fail. Um, I'm not so sure about that one. Yeah, I know that we're human. We make mistakes and things such as that. But my military training suggests that it's not always okay to fail. It is essential that you do your absolute best, and including so that means preparing effectively with everything you've got. And therefore, when you face a situation, you're going to vastly reduce your likelihood of failure. So I don't necessarily agree with the author on that one. Now, the Management Training Institute offers five leadership skills for a crisis. Communication. All right, kind of talked about that. Adaptability your ability to go ahead and modify yourself to the circumstances, self-control. Emotions are going to run high. And if you can't control your emotions in a crisis, well, it's not going to work out. In fact, if you can't control your emotions in a non-crisis, you're probably not a good candidate for crisis leadership. Relationship management. How well do you interact with others? And are you able to go ahead and do that effectively? And then creativity. Now, that's kind of interesting that uh, they say put creativity as the fifth one for leadership skills in a crisis. I guess the idea there is that because this is a unanticipated, perhaps, or a different situation, and it's therefore not going to follow any particular script, your ability to be flexible may be key to your ability to be able to respond effectively. There's some things that we just go through the list, that, 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 and you're done, and you've taken care of it. 
And yeah, you've made a good response. Other things, however, do require you to come up with solutions that have not been thought of before, have not been tried before. That's a little bit of courage in there to say, hey, we've never done this, but we got to do something. So perhaps creativity does have a good place for it. Harvard Business Review, and by the way, all these links they can make available to you if you want to read further on it. Harvard Business Review offers four behaviors that help leaders manage a crisis. Number one, decide with speed over precision. Hmm. Define your priorities, make smart trade-offs, ensure we know who the decision makers are, make sure they're named, and then embrace action. Now, here I like the Harvard approach a little bit more that says don't punish mistakes because in a crisis, the failure to act is often worse. By taking an action, even if it's the wrong action, you set a series of events into motion, and if later you determine this is not working, you can stop and back up and change it. But if you don't do anything, nothing happens, and as a result, the situation continues to decay. So I'll, I'll agree on that one. The speed over precision. You don't always have a choice to get all the details right, so just make a decision. Number two, adapt boldly. Decide what not to do. Throw out yesterday's playbook. Connect to your people on the front line. Deciding what not to do is almost as important as what to do. We have a playbook. We have a plan for everything else like that. But as it was attributed to Eisenhower, the plan is nothing. Planning is everything. And that comes about because, well, the enemy gets a vote, and they say no plan survives contact with reality. Nonetheless, it's the process of having doing that planning that allowed you to start thinking about different things that hopefully you can then make a move to say, yeah, we didn't expect this, but we thought through it. You don't have a deer in a headlight. Reliably deliver, number three, stay alert to priorities. Set your key performance indicators. What do you want to have happen through this crisis and then to the resolution? And also, if you're going to be able to deliver reliably, keep yourself in shape through self-care. That includes diet and exercise and not getting too much in terms of alcohol or caffeine or things such as that. The point is, is that in a crisis, things are going to be tough. I remember in 9-11, I was up for 40 hours straight. And as a result, you have to be able to do some things that are typically well beyond what you would normally expect to be able to do. Harder to do so if you don't keep yourself in shape. And the last one is engage for impact. Connect with your team members. Dig deep to engage your teams. Ask for help when it's appropriate. Focus on the outcomes, your customers, your employees. And the other interesting thing that they recommend is collect and amplify positive messages. That's important because in a crisis, you're going to be facing a lot of discouragement. Something goes wrong, and then something again and again and again. There's multiple things going wrong, and you're like, man, we need some good news. Good news allows you something to hold on to, something to motivate your people, keep them from being totally demoralized. If you take a look at comebacks from sports teams and things like that, Super Bowl 51, for example, where you could be down a whole bunch. And they say, like, yeah, we're just coming back. And use the good news and use that to power people forward. One of the best references I found is from an author by the name of Gene Klan, K-L-A-N-N, from the Center for Creative Leadership. He wrote, a book called Crisis Leadership, Using Military Lessons, Organizational Experiences, and the Power of Influence to Lessen the Impact of Chaos on the People You Lead. All right, pretty long subtitle. But he wrote that after 9-11, reflecting on 25 years in the Army, and he didn't just focus purely on military activities, which I like. He did a very good job on this book. And Clown offers three concepts of crisis for levels. Level one, public embarrassment. All right, it's an impact on your mission. The example you use, again, this book was from several years ago, but Texaco, and we can think about situations like that. For those who don't remember Texaco, there are some issues with regard to some internal messages and email, racially insensitive jokes that ended up costing the company a significant amount of money as well as their business. It was embarrassing. Now we can think of cybersecurity events that become embarrassing, impact our mission. Level two could be injury or property loss or reputational damage, potentially even loss of life, like the Tylenol case that took place around 1982, 83, when someone had poisoned randomly some Tylenol bottles. Uh, that's a big deal. That's a level two crisis. And level three crisis would be 
loss of life or significant damage or even the loss of the organization itself. I think it's something like Enron, where the entire company went down in that scandal. There's no hard, fast and determination between level one, level two, and level three, but pretty quickly you're going to assess how deep is this, how bad is this going to be. Now, leadership skills are important in a crisis, and what Klan offers is a concept of these eight. Communications. Have a strategy. Have a calm strategy. Get a way to get the information out. Be articulate. One of the things that I really want people to work on as a leadership skill is be effective in communication. And that just takes years of practice. Um, yeah, kind of, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, oh my goodness, it's amazing sometimes how people in significant roles are unable to communicate. And it's just the self-discipline practice. Be articulate. Be effective in your communication. Get to the point. Organize your act actions. And then think of Winston Churchill, who as a communicator was able to inspire a nation in the darkest hours to be able to communicate that vision of there's a positive future going forward. And speaking of which, have a clarity of vision and values. We talk about visions and vision statements, and here's where we're going. And the visions are effective, but they're effective only if they're associated with a value statement that could inspire others to achievement. If your values are off, then your vision's not going to work because people are going to say, I can't align with that. Show that you care. In a crisis, emotions run high. For those of us who remember Malden Mills, that was a uh, plant that burnt down back in 1995. I think it was up in Massachusetts. And the CEO, Aaron Firestein, said, I'm going to continue to pay all my employees while we rebuild. I could have taken his money, said, hey, I'm retired. I got the insurance check. I'm out of here. But he went ahead and he stuck it out. And he showed that he was going to take care of all of his employees. After they rebuilt the factory. Same people with the same type of approach were producing up to 70% more because they understood that their leader cared about them. And they returned that to a higher superior work ethic. Another important line, personal example, lead from the front. People say that what you do speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you say. And I get that. You've got to be able to get in there and not just sit in the background and send people out. But leading from the front does mean that you have to be in charge and you can't therefore be out there picking up every last item that's on the floor of the data center if there's a problem. But make sure that you're visible, that people can see you, and be out there with your people. Let them know that you're there. It's important to have character, personal integrity. People will forgive an honest mistake, but they won't forgive a moral lapse. If you make a mistake, you go, oh, man, I screwed up. Okay, fine, yeah, sometimes it happens. But if somebody does something, you know, that was immoral, that was unethical, that was just plain wrong, and that violated something that I feel deeply, then they're going to have a hard time getting people to follow you. Be competent. If you really want to find a way to multiply your employee anxiety, put an incompetent manager in, in place. When they see that the boss doesn't know what they're doing, it's looking like something out of a TV sitcom, then that's going to be a difficulty and particularly is going to be much more difficult in a crisis. Have courage. Be willing to tell the truth. Do what's right. Get out front and make things happen. And then lastly, decisiveness. Make the call. Invite your staff to provide recommendations, but don't always follow those recommendations. Be willing to listen to them and process them, but ultimately it's your responsibility. If you're getting conflicting imports or inputs from your staff, have them write it down. Take a few moments, review it. And if you choose to make a decision that does not reflect what your people who have offered it to you, be willing to give them a moment of explanation. Hey, thank you for that, but Based upon what I know, what I have experienced, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm not ignoring you. I didn't disregard you. However, in my judgment, this is it. And I'm going to take ownership of it. And if you're right, great. If you're wrong and the other person, well, then that's a problem. You've made your best call. And again, a crisis, they say it can forge a leader or it can break one, right? Well, not necessarily because 
if you haven't developed the capabilities and, and practice the attributes of crisis leadership, a crisis isn't going to magically make you a hero. And what was interesting is that on the 8th and 9th of September 2001, I was teaching a leadership course in Washington, D.C. to 25 officers. And the final module of that course was combat and crisis leadership. So here I am, 9th September doing that. 10th of September, I'm speaking at EGOV in Washington, D.C., and then I drive up the night on the 10th, and Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, I show up for work at 8 o'clock. And, of course, you've heard all that from the previous recording. So in my opinion, the success that we were able to achieve as first responders was due to individual initiative, bravery, courage, but also the role that I ended up playing in a sort of a crisis leadership. I felt I was well prepared for because it's something I'd literally studied to the point where I could teach it to others. So become a master of that yourself. So what can you do to prepare yourself? Get really good at communications with your people. Share information regularly. Let people know that you're communicating back and forth, that they're not kept in the dark. And therefore, when there's a crisis that takes place and you can continue that communications, they'll feel much more comfortable. They know somebody's in charge. Create consistency. Let people expect a thought out response. Inconsistency in a crisis is fatal. Again, if there's an error and you figure it out, change direction. But you want to maintain a sense of direction that other people can follow. Be clear, maintain a clarity of vision. And as I said before, that vision should be tied to your values. Plan and consider different scenarios. You don't know what's going to happen. The nature of a crisis, uncertain. So by planning and walking your team through different scenarios over time, they kind of know what to do. Connect with your people by caring. Set an example. Let people know that you're there for them and they'll be there for you. And practice. Do more than just tabletop exercises. The problem with tabletop exercises is that you miss stuff. And all of a sudden you realize that, A, we did all these exercises once a quarter. And then we had a power failure. The diesel generator is supposed to kick in. And it didn't work because there is no fuel in it because nobody ever thought that it was their responsibility. That's a real situation that took place from one of the security leaders that I'd heard. So be aware of that and do more than just the tabletop exercises. Mike Frank was a gentleman that I knew. We went to high school together and he was the CIO of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey back in September of 01. We both spoke at a conference in February of 02 in, in Manhattan. And I remember Mike talking about their preparations, and he said that summer they had done a full-scale test over in New Jersey of running their backup systems. And everybody went over there, and they let off the computers, and they transferred the data, and they actually ran remotely. And his people complained, oh, man, I got to pay extra for the Baranzano Narrows Bridge and take a PATH train and got to pay for daycare, but made them do it. Well, on the 11th of September, they lost their data center. It was in Tower 1. But... All the people got out. They made payroll that Friday. And that was his message that he had is the fact that you're going to, uh, to paraphrase another military leader, Admiral Hyman Rickover, you're going to fight the way you train. Your people are going to respond the way they've been trained. And so make sure that you don't have to stop and think in a crisis. That's another Rickover. Anybody who stops to think in a crisis shows a severe lack of training. So get people moving forward. And then... Consider having a crisis action plan where you've identified your risks, you've come up with some threshold for declaring when is a crisis actually occurring, and then have initial immediate actions that can be taken right away. No questioning, no having to pick up the phone, no asking for permission. Boom, 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 do the initial triage. Establish a communications plan, and don't forget you have to deal with the media as well. It might be another department, but then make sure your people, therefore, say, don't talk to the media, let them go through the PR make responsibilities and assignments, have some detailed plans, even to include things like evacuation if safety ever becomes an issue, and have prescribed checklists for departments and review them on a regular basis. Bottom line, it's all about your people. Communicate, have a clear vision, solid values, and show you care. And if you go ahead and you take the time to prepare yourself and go through scenarios and really examine your ability to make decisions under adverse circumstances. When a crisis comes, 
you'll be ready. Well, thanks for listening. As always, please follow us on LinkedIn and and make sure you subscribe to our podcast and, and share with your colleagues on social media so they can increase their understanding as well. This is G. Mark Hardy, and I'm pleased to be with you again. And stay safe. Till next time.